For this third training segment, I'm going to explain how our brains have been designed to work best in community and how we can increase the effectiveness of the Emmanuel approach by deliberately integrating this intriguing bit of brain science into the process. And then Charlotte and I will demonstrate. We will demonstrate again the initial steps of the Emmanuel approach process up to the point of, of establishing an interactive connection with the Lord. We will demonstrate again using a positive memory that includes an experience of God's presence. And we will demonstrate the application of this new bit of brain science by Charlotte repeatedly coaching me to describe everything that comes into my awareness, regardless of whether it feels important, makes sense, or is neatly packaged. Actually, she was already doing this for the previous two demonstrations, but now you will be more aware of it and you will understand why she's doing it. How our brains are designed to work best in community and how we can increase the effectiveness of the Emmanuel approach by deliberately integrating this intriguing bit of brain science into the process. Actually, there are a number of ways in which our brains are designed to work best in community. But here's the piece that is most relevant for our Emmanuel approach exercises. Our brains are more able to feel the importance and understand the meaning of our mental content when we describe it out loud to another person. There's actually quite a bit of evidence supporting these conclusions, and I discussed this supporting evidence in detail in the Big Lion book. For the purposes of this presentation, I will just be providing a brief summary. So, some of the evidence supporting these conclusions comes from emotional healing case studies. For example, when I was 18 months old, my brother and I got sent, to stay with, sent away to stay with friends for three to four weeks during a time when my mother was so physically ill that she couldn't care for us. My brother was four, so he could understand what was happening. But, but at 18 months, I did not yet have enough language to understand the reassurances that were being offered. That my mother was sick, but that eventually she would be okay and I would see her again. At a year and a half, with minimal language, I experienced this month-long separation in much the same way as I would have experienced my parents' sudden deaths. They disappeared suddenly and stayed away much longer than, I could, <clears throat> than my ability to understand or cope with their absence. This extended separation from my parents was certainly more than I was able to successfully process, and therefore the whole experience ended up as psychological trauma for me. What happened when I first started to do healing work on these memories is the data point that's relevant for this discussion. I focused on the triggered thoughts and emotions that I guessed to be coming from these memories, and then asked the Lord to help me access the underlying trauma. And immediately after I asked the Lord to help me access the underlying traumatic memories, thoughts and images start coming into my mind. I get an image of holding a telephone to my ear. The receiver is huge. I'm looking up to where the cord goes into the wall. So I'm obviously like really small, like the size of a year and a half, uh, a one and a half year old. I'm looking around this room. There's a doorway leading to a hallway to my right. There's a big sofa across the room in front of me. And then this thought comes to me. I can hear her voice. If I can hear her voice, she's, she's got to be here somewhere. I, I wonder where she is. Where is she? I wonder where she's hiding. The sofa. The sofa is big enough for a grown-up to hide behind. Maybe she's hiding behind the sofa. But here's the strange part. I don't have any sense that these images or thoughts are important. And I don't perceive their meaning. The thoughts and images don't feel important. And I don't even recognize that they're coming from my own memories. In fact, this effect is so complete that I tell my prayer partner, it's not working, nothing's coming, I'm not getting anything. Fortunately, he, he knows about this phenomena, so he coaches me to just describe whatever comes into my awareness. You know the drill, just describe whatever's coming into your awareness, regardless of whether or not it feels important or makes any sense. So eventually I cooperate, and as soon as I start to describe these thoughts and images out loud to my prayer partner, this huge, wave, this huge wave of emotions wells up inside of me. I start sobbing, and all of a sudden I recognize, oh my goodness, these thoughts and images or emotions are coming from my time at the Wetzel's. I'm on the phone with Mom. I'm remembering being at the Wetzel's, talking to Mom on the telephone. When I was 18 months old, I, hadn't, I had not been able to understand that Mom could be 150 miles away and still be talking to me. I figured if I can hear her voice, 
She's got to be nearby somewhere. She's got to be here in the room with me. And here's the point. As long as the content was isolated inside my head, I was not able to feel its importance or to perceive its meaning. But as I described it out loud to my prayer partner, both of these pieces fell into place and I became able to feel that it was important and to see what it meant. Let me share another example. So, I'm facilitating an Emmanuel approach session. And after, and after the initial prayer, asking Jesus to guide every thought, image, memory, emotion, and physical sensation coming into the person's awareness, she pauses for a minute or two and then reports, it's not working, nothing's coming, I'm, I'm not getting anything. However, with coaching to describe whatever is coming into her awareness, regardless of whether or not it makes any sense or feels important, she eventually acknowledges that, well, actually, she has been getting a mental image, but she assures me that it doesn't make any sense and that it is certainly not important. With more coaching, she eventually, acknowledge, she eventually describes, I'm just, I'm just in the, I, I just see myself in the car with my family. I'm just sitting in the car, looking out the window as we're driving down the highway. But then she suddenly recognizes, wait, oh, oh my goodness. This image is from the beginning of the trip to, to visit Uncle Bob. This image is from the beginning of that trip. And then she goes on to describe how the image that she's been getting was from the beginning of a trip that had ended in deep rejection. How the image that had initially felt so unimportant and seemed so irrelevant was actually from the beginning of a really important unresolved traumatic memory. Just as with my experience, as long as the content was isolated inside her head, she was not able to feel its importance or to perceive its meaning. But as she described it out loud to me, both of these pieces fell into place and she became able to feel that it was important and to recognize what it meant. As part of this same discussion about how our brains are designed to work best in community, the Big Lion book provides a detailed description of a fascinating, compelling neurological case study about a man who develops a brain tumor in his, in his right prefrontal cortex. I don't have time to describe the details here, but the short summary is that damage to his right prefrontal cortex eliminates his ability to feel the importance of options, choices, and mental content. For example, if he was on the way to his, do- to his daughter's birthday party and he noticed a barber shop that was conveniently located and offering a special sale on quick trims, he might decide to skip his daughter's party because he could not feel that being present for his daughter's party was more important than taking advantage of this convenient and cost-saving opportunity to get his hair cut. A large body of neurological case studies and other research regarding the prefrontal cortex provides additional pieces to the puzzle. The right prefrontal cortex is the primary area for interactions with other people, and especially for face-to-face communication. The left prefrontal cortex is especially involved in language-based communication. And both right and left prefrontal cortices are heavily involved in perceiving the meaning of a particular piece of mental content, and especially in perceiving how any particular mental content relates to one's personal story. Putting all of these pieces together, we get the following. One, our internal mental content needs to be processed through our right-sided prefrontal cortex in order for us to be able to feel its importance. If a particular piece of relevant, significant mental content is not processed through our right-sided prefrontal cortex, we can look right at it and not feel its importance. Like in the emotional healing session for my separation trauma, when I was looking right at the images and thoughts from my time with the Wetzels, but could not feel that they were important. Two, our internal mental content needs to be processed through both our right and left prefrontal cortices in order for us to be able to perceive its meaning and especially for us to be able to recognize how a given piece of content relates to our personal story. If a particular piece of important, meaningful mental content is not processed through both prefrontal cortices, we can look right at it and not perceive its meaning 
or recognize how it relates to our personal story. Like in the emotional healing session for my separation trauma, when I was looking right at the images and thoughts from my time with the Wetzels, but could not perceive their importance or even recognize that they were coming from my own memories. 3. The face-to-face -face social interaction task of communicating with another person causes the content we are describing to be processed through the right prefrontal cortex. And 4. The language task of getting words to describe our mental content causes the content to be processed through the left prefrontal cortex. Therefore, when we describe our mental content to a prayer partner or prayer circle, the combination of the social interaction task and the language task causes the content we are describing to be processed through both our right and left prefrontal cortices, and thereby enables us to feel the importance of the contents we are describing, to perceive the meaning of the content we are describing, and especially to recognize how the content relates to our personal stories. These benefits will help us to perceive Jesus' presence by helping us to feel the importance and recognize the meaning of subtle manifestations of his presence that we might otherwise miss. And these benefits will help us to connect with Jesus by helping us to feel the importance and recognize the meaning of subtle interactive content coming from Jesus that we might otherwise miss. My own experience provides a good example. My perceptions of Jesus' presence are usually very subtle and faint. Content that comes to me from Jesus is usually very subtle and faint. And I consistently find that I am much more able to perceive his presence and to recognize and receive the content that comes from him when I can describe what's coming into my awareness out loud to another person. So if you have just been doing these Emmanuel exercises by yourself, and you have not been perceiving and connecting with the Lord as you observe me experiencing in these demonstrations, it may be because you are not benefiting from the ways our brains work best in community. As you can see, as I am doing these exercises, I am describing everything that comes into my awareness out loud to Charlotte. And this describing my mental content out loud to another person helps me to feel the importance and recognize the meaning of subtle manifestations of Jesus' presence and subtle content from Jesus. So, again, if you are just doing the exercises by yourself, then you are not receiving these benefits. Therefore, in light of everything I have discussed regarding how our brains work best in community, I really, really, really encourage you to do Emmanuel Approach sessions with a prayer partner or practice group so that you can also benefit from the ways in which our brains work best in community. So now Charlotte and I will demonstrate. We will demonstrate again going through the initial steps in the Emmanuel approach process using a positive memory that includes experiencing the Lord's presence. After getting the interactive connection in place, we will demonstrate looking at and thinking about an issue or question with Jesus. And throughout the session, Charlotte will demonstrate repeatedly coaching me to describe everything that comes into my awareness. And now, after the explanations about how our brains work best in community, you will understand why Charlotte coaches me so persistently and explicitly. Describe everything that comes into your awareness, regardless of whether or not it feels important, makes sense, or is neatly packaged. To summarize very quickly, first, Charlotte will help me to find a positive memory and then help me to recall and reconnect with the details until I feel appreciation. And as with the demonstration for training segment number two, I'll use a memory that includes a connection with the Lord. To take advantage of the way in which our relationships are carried in our memories, and to take advantage of the way in which reconnecting with a memory of connecting with God will recreate, at least to some extent, the same conditions that work for connecting with God in the original experience. When I am connected to the memory and feel appreciation, Charlotte will coach me to offer what I call the Emmanuel Invitation and Request Prayer. She will coach me to pray something like, Jesus, I thank you that you are here with me in this memory, and I welcome your presence. Help me to perceive your living presence. 
Help me to make the transition from remembering you with me to perceiving you and connecting with you as a living, interactive presence. And after the Emmanuel invitation and request prayer, Charlotte will coach me to ask Jesus, How do you feel about being with me? As described in training segments 1 and 2, once I have established an interactive connection with Jesus, there are a number of options for what to do with the rest of the session. For this demonstration, Charlotte will help me to look at and think about a question or issue with Jesus. Finally, throughout the session, Charlotte will repeatedly coach me to observe and describe whatever comes into my awareness. And again, as I describe my mental content out loud to Charlotte, I will be benefiting from the ways in which our brains work best in community, and that's part of why these exercises are so effective for me. I really, really encourage you. Find a way to work with an Emmanuel Approach prayer partner or practice group so that you can also share what comes into your awareness with another person and thereby benefit from the ways in which our brains work best in community. Now let us show you what this looks like. So the first step is to find a positive memory to recall and reconnect with. If you have a memory that includes experiencing God's presence, that would be ideal, but we can also just start with any positive memory. For example, a memory of getting a Christmas present you particularly enjoyed, a memory of a special experience from a family vacation, a memory of playing with a favorite pet, a memory of an especially positive time with friends, a memory of a beautiful nature experience, or a memory of thoroughly enjoying your favorite meal. Yeah, I have a memory. Okay, so I want you to close your eyes and imagine yourself being back inside of the original experience and describe the memory in as much detail as possible. For example, what did you see, hear, smell, taste, feel on your skin? What thoughts were you having at the time? What thoughts come as you think about it now? What emotions were you having at the time? What emotions come as you think about it now? How does your body feel? So I want you to focus on and describe the details until you feel appreciation. Yeah, so I'm remembering when I was doing, a, I went to medical school in Kansas City, but I had this away rotation where I did a rotation for a month in South Carolina, in um, Charleston, South Carolina. And sometimes I would go out real early in the morning and walk along the beach. So this morning I got up and I'm out on the beach, uh, maybe 5.30 or something, it was 20 minutes before sunrise. And uh, the sky was getting light and beautiful. There was a lot of colors in the sky. And the ocean was just flat. I've, I've almost never seen the, the ocean like that. It was just a, it was just a mirror, it's just mm. like glass. So all the, all the beauty and the color in the sky was reflected. So it was kind of a double image of the sunrise. And, this, and the sand, the beach was beautiful. Um, the, the tide had been going out all night, so it had been washing and smoothing the sands. So there's this wide, flat, perfect beach. Not a footprint. I was the first person there. There wasn't a person or a footprint as far as I could see in either direction. It was just perfect and calm and quiet. And so I started walking along the beach. And I noticed, after walking for a while, I noticed in the, dis in the distance there's this big dark patch, uh, large, you know, um, quite a ways off. And as I got closer to it, I realized there was these little teeny dark specks. It was like this huge area of the beach where there were these, there, there were these little dark specks all spaced evenly. Mm -hmm. And as I got you know, maybe 50, 60 feet away, I had my binoculars with me. And so I looked with my binoculars and I realized it was like 100,000 to 200,000 tree swallows. It was the mm. super flock, the East Coast super flock of migrating tree swallows mm. down the coast. And they were all, uh, they were all just resting on the sand, on the, on the beach. And they were spaced just evenly. Each, each little swallow, they were like six inches apart, perfectly evenly spaced, each one with their own little, own little spot, just sitting quietly on the sand. 
And as I got closer, you know, when I was maybe 30 feet away, and the sun is just, the sun is just coming over the, just coming out of the water. It's just coming above the horizon. So that first, the first rays of the rising sun, that warm orange, pink, rich hue. I'm looking at the tree swallows, and they're, they're the, there's this, they're a beautiful bird. They're, they have this dazzling white breast, and their backs are this intense, iridescent blue. Mm. And with the direct sunlight, the sun's just coming out of the water, and and their brilliant white breasts were just lit up with this warm orange pink sunrise sunlight. I keep getting a little bit closer, a little bit closer. And with my binoculars, you know, I can see I can see their eyes blinking, I can see their little feet moving as they shuffle around. And I can, <laughs> when I'm 30, 20, 30 feet away, I can hear them chittering, this huge big congregation. They're all just chittering quietly. And the, you know, with the sun 10, 10 minutes above the horizon now, it's just the, the light is bright and clear, and it's just a spectacular view of this beautiful bird. And then this huge, huge flock of them. It was like 100 feet wide, maybe the length of two or three football fields. Mm. I just inched a little bit closer, a little bit closer, a little bit closer. And when I'm maybe 15 or 20 feet away, the whole flock just whoosh, lifts up into the air. And they didn't leave. You know, for 15 or 20 minutes, they just stayed there within 10 feet of the ground. Yeah, they, didn't, they didn't fly away up into, the, up into the sky. They just stayed right close to the ground, hmm. right on the beach, just flying, probably getting all the little bugs in the area. I, did, I just walked into the cloud. It was like walking into a snowstorm or... Hmm like snowflakes. I mean, I, just, I walked into this giant cloud of tree swallows and they're flying so close to me. I can hear them chittering and their wingtips are flicking my hair. And I'm just thinking, oh, this is the most amazing experience in my life. It was certainly it was a once-in-a-lifetime nature experience. Totally you know, one of the highlights of my lifetime nature enjoyment. And at the time, it, at the time this first happened, when I was in medical school, I was not aware of the Lord's tangible presence, personal presence. Um, just like with my Grand Canyon Pentecost summer tanager memory, it started out as just a beautiful nature memory, and then I used this swallow memory uh, for an Emmanuel exercise, and we upgraded it. So, in the Emmanuel session, when I started out with this as just a nature memory, I. I went to this part of the memory where I'm, I'm walking into the cloud, I'm walking through the middle of the cloud of tree swallows, and I did that prayer. You know, Lord, I welcome your presence. Help me to perceive your living, interactive presence here with me. And then just right away, I had this image of Jesus standing. He's walking next to me, and he's just, he's going, like, he's just like, he has this big grin on his face, and he's just an uh, expression of joy and wonder, and he's just like looking, he's just, you know, looking up in the air and looking as the swallows are all flying around us. And he goes to me, he turns to me and he goes, can you believe this, Carl? Yeah, this is so amazing. And we're both just kind of excited to be together and we're, we're just like both, wow, this is so amazing. Can you, can you believe this? And that was, mm -hmm. that was a, an amazing experience to start with. And it was a really, that was a really, poignant, beautiful experience to share it with, to become aware of the rest of the truth that he was there with me enjoying it. Mm. And so, uh, yeah, there's my Emmanuel nature memory. I definitely can feel appreciation there. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, so now I want you to pray something like, Jesus, I welcome you to be with me in this memory. Help me to perceive your living presence. Help me to make the transition from remembering you with me to perceiving your presence as living and interactive. And then describe everything that comes into your awareness, regardless of whether it feels important, makes sense, or is neatly packaged. Yeah, so Lord, I do. I welcome your presence. I welcome you to be with me in this memory. 
I do ask you to help me perceive your living presence. Help me to turn that corner. Help me to make that transition from just remembering you with me to experience your presence as living and, and interactive right here with me today. So it's kind of like, not sure how he does this, but I have a, you know, a quarter, a third maybe, I'm sort of still in the memory and he's sort of there still kind of like, that was so amazing. And then I'm also kind of perceiving his presence kind of a subtle image of his face in front of me here where he's he's kind of got it has a big smile on his face and he's kind of like that was that was really amazing wasn't it he's he's and the kind of the, um like often he doesn't say words to me but I can just sort of he lets me like I can he lets me kind of be inside his head where I can sort of share his thoughts with him mm -hmm. and then so I can he's I can sort of perceive that he's he, he's thinking that was really was that was really amazing, wasn't it? And also, like it's it's fun. He he's really enjoying remembering it with me. Mm. Hmm. Okay, so I'd like you to ask Jesus, how do you feel about being with me? I mean, if if you already have an interactive connection, the interaction interaction with Jesus around this question can enrich the connection. And if you're not sure whether you, your perception of Jesus is still just a memory or whether his presence is living and interactive, this question can help clarify. If you're perceiving Jesus' living, interactive presence, then you'll sense a living, interactive response to your question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I'm definitely already having an interactive connection. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, Lord, we'll go for the, upgrade, for the <laughs> enriched. Mm -hmm. We'll enrich it even further. So, yeah, Lord, how do you feel about being with me and I kind of sense uh, even as I was asking the question he's kind of got a little a little grin sort of um, like yeah we got I can I often get I it's somewhere I understand what what he's I understand the meaning immediately but it takes a while to get words for it but mm. it's kind of like uh, yeah we already know or um, he's almost chuckling as if, like, as if we can't, as if we can't um, already tell that I'm really enjoying mm. being here with you. Or mm -hmm. kind of like we, we all know the answer to that question. Mm -hmm. But not even saying, just sort of, as he's here with me and he has the smile that flashes, it's in his thoughts, it's like, yeah, well, of, of course, you know, of course you know I enjoy being with you. Mm -hmm. So that's... Mm. And, uh, and the thought comes to the, he particularly enjoys appreciating nature with me because um, I can appreciate it mm. uh, so thoroughly. Mm -hmm. uh, I can share the appreciation with him more than more than many who just don't know as much about nature. And you, mm. The more you know, the more you can, the more deeply you can appreciate it. So he he, can, he particularly enjoys appreciating his creation with me because hmm. we can um, we can do that together at a a particularly intense rich level mm-hmm mm-hmm So there you go. That's what it looks like to go through the initial steps in the Emmanuel approach process using a positive memory that includes experiencing God's presence. And that's what it looks like to repeatedly coach the recipient to describe everything that's coming into his awareness. I want to remind you again, if you do not yet have positive memories that include a connection with God, you can start with any positive memory like I did in segment one with the Grand Canyon Pentecost Summer Tanager memory when it was still just a beautiful nature memory. And I want to remind you again, this basic Emmanuel approach process does not always work right away for everybody. The good news is that if the process does not work for you, it just means that there are blockages in the way. And when you resolve the blockages, 
you will consistently be able to perceive God's presence and be able to establish an interactive connection with God. Finally, I want to note that this teaching to describe everything that comes into your awareness is referring to mental content that does not initially make sense or feel important. This teaching is not encouraging you to force yourself to share vulnerable content that you are not yet ready to share. See chapter 16, page 199 in the Big Lion book for a much more detailed discussion of this point.